All right, Kourtney Kardashian is pregnant, and I have some thoughts about it. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Liz, are you kidding me? Are we stooping to this level, talking about this topic on this show? And the answer to that is actually not an answer, but a question to you. Do you know how influential the Kardashian cartel has been on our culture? Do you know the things that you see every day, the behaviors exhibited by young people, Gen Z and millennials, that are begot of Kardashian culture? Think about the fact that young people only wear these hideous baggy clothes. That's all from the Kardashians. That's from Kanye West, when he was married to Kim Kardashian, he dressed her in all those really ugly neutral colors, like colors without any color and these baggy clothes and these big honking gym shoes. That's from the Kardashians. You see all these young women with these duck lips, too much filler in their lips, that's from the Kardashians. All the, the really long, really bright nails that young people wear, that's from the Kardashians. One family, one family made that, Im, Im, that, that impact on our culture all across the country. And it's not just those external things that they've impacted. The Kardashians have impacted the way that young women think the way that young women think about sexuality, the way that young people think about families, the way that young people think about relationships, the way that young people think about business and about wealth. The Kardashians have been perhaps the biggest cultural influence in my entire lifetime. Not on me, but on society in general. And so I had a very interesting thought when I watched this video of Kourtney Kardashian, she's the oldest one, she's Kim's older sister, announcing her pregnancy. Now, Kourtney Kardashian, for those of you who don't follow along, has three children already. She was not married, but she had three children with Scott Disick. And I will confess to you, I used to watch the Kardashians, Keeping Up with the Kardashians on E! like 10 years ago when I was in my early 20s when it first came on. Very entertaining, very trashy. Um, I don't follow along with the show anymore, but I certainly do see, just like everybody else in the world, what they're up to and what their life updates are. And it was from that, just seeing the wave tops or the highlights of what's going on with their life, that I had the most interesting thought that I wanted to run by you. So Kourtney Kardashian did not end up getting married to Scott Disick. I guess he was on drugs or something at the time. They broke up. I always kind of liked the two of them together in the show, but they decided not to be together to the detriment of their family. Kourtney Kardashian ended up getting together with and ultimately marrying Travis Barker. Travis Barker is from the band Blink 182, uh, totally covered in tattoos, really skinny, that look, maybe you're familiar with him. And Kourtney Kardashian's in her 40s. She's been open about the fact that she wanted to have more children. Uh, she even said she went through in vitro fertilization and it didn't work. And then she kind of surprised the world when she announced her pregnancy. We can show this video. It was actually at one of Travis's Blink-182 concerts. Um, we're going to bring it up on the screen. So she holds up this sign at the concert that says, Travis, I'm pregnant. Jumps up and down. Of course, the cameras catch it, put it on the big screen. And um, the crowd goes wild because they're very excited. They know exactly what has been happening during this saga of trying to get pregnant because the Kardashians live their lives they're a reality TV show family. They live their lives in front of the camera. They're also social media. Uh, on social media, to say the least, they're some of the most followed people on social media. So Travis sees this sign, he comes off the stage. One of the other band members comes off the stage. I confess, I have no idea who it is because I don't really follow this band. Travis comes off the stage, they embrace, and within about two seconds, the entire world knows that Kourtney Kardashian is pregnant. Now, this was staged, clearly, as all reality TV is staged. This was not Kourtney Kardashian telling Travis Barker for the first time. This was Kourtney Kardashian telling the world that she's pregnant. And also, for those of you who are Blink-182 fans, the way that Courtney announced by holding up that sign that says, Travis, I'm pregnant, is actually a reference. It's a throwback to um, the song, All the Small Things by Blink-182 from like 20 years ago, 30 years ago, whenever it came out. Um, in the music video for that song, 20 years ago, a girl holds up a sign that says, Travis, I'm pregnant. So leave it to the Kardashians to actually make an announcement in this clever of a way. She posted, Courtney posted pictures of her growing baby bump after this. So I have no idea how far along she is, but my guess would be about halfway. She looks like she has a, about a halfway belly going on here. And this is where I started thinking about this because part of me, when I heard this announcement, I was like, oh, you know, I kind of always hoped she'd end up with Scott, the father of her three children. And um, she didn't, she ended up marrying Travis, but I still kind of hoped that she would end up with Scott. But then I realized something about the Kardashians, that despite the fact that 
The reason that we know of the Kardashians is because Robert Kardashian, their now deceased father, was an attorney for O.J. Simpson's defense team. Um, and the fact that Kim Kardashian made a sex tape and then essentially publicized it to make herself famous. The reason that people like following the Kardashians is actually not because of their billionaire status. It's not because of their over-the-top luxury, and it's not actually because of Kim Kardashian's infamy. The reason people like watching the Kardashians is because they appeal to actually something very wholesome inside of us all. And I know, again, you're thinking, really, Liz, the Kardashians appeal to something wholesome? But hear me out, because I think that this is something that's very encouraging for our culture when we look to the Kardashians for family values. What are the Kardashians, what, what is their biggest news stories? Their biggest news stories are when someone's proposed to, when someone gets married, and when someone has a baby. And the way that they all react when someone announces a pregnancy is with utter joy. They celebrate the pregnancy. They celebrate the baby. They're constantly posting pictures with their kids, which says to me, and again, I'm watching this video, and I'm thinking, you know what? This is actually very interesting because the reason that they stage an announcement like this is because we all want to consume it, right? They're very sav savvy business people. They know this is the kind of content that we want to consume. Otherwise, they wouldn't create it. They wouldn't make this announcement in this way if they knew that it wasn't going to be a big hit, which it is. It's all over international news. And the reason that they announce their pregnancies and rejoice in their pregnancies and make their births on video and have these big opulent weddings, these over-the-top weddings, is because deep down, that's actually what the young women who they influence want. The young women don't want the sexual promiscuity. They don't want the drama. They don't want the, um, they don't want necessarily the billionaire status. What they want is what the Kardashians pretend to represent, which is a tight-knit family. We're gonna talk more about that in just a second, but first I wanna to talk to you about Students for Life. 2024 is right around the corner, and both parties recognize that young voters are going to play a key role in deciding the upcoming election. Students for Life Action is the only national pro-life organization working to turn young people against abortion. And as a result, they're facing constant attacks from pro-abortion radicals, including Antifa, and a group called Jane's Revenge. It's the same group that organized protests outside of the homes of Supreme Court justices and vandalized crisis pregnancy centers. Students for Life Action even had to take legal action against universities who've tried to silence them for speaking the truth about abortion. I can tell you that no other group gets under the skin of pro-abortion radicals more than Students for Life Action. But frankly, standing up to the pro-abortion mob day in and day out can be grueling. That's why I am asking you today to join me in encouraging these young pro-life leaders Text Liz to 20401 to sign your statement of support for pro-life students. This simple action will go a long way to lift up the next generation and encourage them to not back down in the face of attacks by pro-abortion radicals. That's L-I-Z to 20401 to tell pro-life students you have their backs in the battle to end abortion. Text Liz to 20401 to tell pro-life students on the front lines that you have their backs. So think about it even a step further. So it's not just that their biggest announcements are about proposals, are about relationships, are about marriages, are about babies, and that all of their social media is plastered with pictures of things that they're doing with their children. Um, this this uh, portrayal or this appearance of being a very tight-knit family, right? The sisters are best friends. They're very close with their mom. They portray themselves to be a very tight-knit family. They also embrace and you and I would say, uh, you and I would probably criticize the extent to which they embrace what the left calls gender stereotypes. The women in the Kardashian family, again, we can criticize how promiscuous they are, we can criticize how revealing their outfits are, and that criticism is warranted, but they embrace womanhood. They're not trying to downplay the female body, they're not trying to downplay how they, uh, their attire, female attire. They're not trying to downplay the fact that they're interested in female things um, like makeup and hair and fashion and uh, 
passing that down to their children. Again, you can certainly criticize, as I do, the level to which they take that, the unhealthy level to which they take that. But ultimately, think about all the young women across the, across the entire country, not just Gen Z, but millennials too. So every woman, just about every woman from the age of 13 through the age of 45 has been influenced by these women. Why? Well, because the drama is a little salacious and they have a pretty interesting dynamic, sure. But mostly because they're portraying something that women want. They're not showing themselves at work. They're not showing themselves separated from their children, which I'm sure they are given what they do for their business. They're showing themselves in this tight-knit family. And that's what I thought when I saw Kourtney Kardashian's video. I thought, you know what? This is interesting because this family, who's in my opinion has been very destructive, to American culture, given the the notions on promiscuous sex and um, the mutilation they've done to their bodies in the name, again, of of promiscuous sex. But they're actually exploiting in an improperly ordered way a healthy desire of all women. It's kind of like we've talked about before, we've talked about Andrew Tate and how his diagnosis of a cultural problem Um, this attack on masculinity is accurate, that there is an attack on masculinity, that men are feminized. Masculinity is told, uh, young men are told that masculinity is toxic. They're told they should be beta males, alpha males are shamed. They're told that they're responsible for violence and murder and that, you know, if it's not beaten out of them, they have tendencies to rape. Like men are demonized in our culture. And Andrew Tate comes along and says, no, men should be men. Men should be masculine. And in that, he's correct. In that diagnosis, he's correct, and that's why he appeals to so many young men, but his prescription for his diagnosis is wildly destructive. His prescription is, I mean, he owns a pornography business, right? He's only telling young men that they should exploit women, and um, he he's exploiting young women himself to make money, and then, of course, he's glorifying wealth. So diagnosis, correct. Prescription, really, really destructive. Same with that tr- uh, trend that's going all over TikTok with the trad wife, um, the trad wife, who's this this girl who's decided to be a housewife. And I don't know if she has any children, so I don't want to call her a stay-at-home mom because I don't think she has any children yet. Um, but she's staying at home. She dresses kind of in a 1940s style, and she has a very submissive attitude. And she's getting a lot of criticism from people on the left for choosing to be a housewife, but also from people on the right because she's being a little too submissive, or so it appears. But the thing about all three of these cultural forces, whether it's the Kardashians, whether it's Andrew Tate, or whether it's this trad wife fad, is they're appealing to something that simply can't be extinguished within the human being, within young men and young women. And this desire for young women to be feminine, this desire for young men to be masculine, this desire of young men and women to form families, to get married, fall in love, have children, build a life together, have a tight-knit community, and while these three and these three cultural forces, the Kardashians, Andrew Tate, and this trad wife, aren't doing it in the right way, it's interesting to me for, to step back and look at it because for the first time, for the first time, these cultural influences in this generation are actually steering the ship closer to what fulfillment looks like for a society. They're just forgetting one important one important ingredient to fulfillment, which would help them properly order their prescriptions and not to sound preachy or like a Bible thumper, although perhaps I am. That ingredient, of course, is God. If they added God to the equation in any of these three instances, then they would properly apply, properly apply, whether it's the Kardashians, whether it's Andrew Tate, whether it's Trad Wife, they'd properly apply what they're trying to do in a healthy way. Um, But when I saw Kourtney Kardashian's announcement, that is the thought that came to my mind that I thought would be important enough to run by you, to share with you, since like it or not, no matter how hard we try to avoid it, we are influenced by this family. Um, Okay, did you guys hear about that crazy story about that, it's not a submarine, it's called a submersible that apparently got lost while trying to explore the remains of the Titanic in the Atlantic Ocean. We're gonna talk about that in just a second, but first I want to talk to you about Revolutionary Relief. Revolutionary Relief is a huge game changer. The topical roll and gel capsules work together to provide targeted pain relief. 
Applying the roll directly to your knees, your elbows, your neck, or your back will bring immediate soothing relief. And the gel capsules target internal pain and inflammation, giving long-lasting results. The secret lies in the patented active ingredient, Canopia Active, which is derived from plants. It's 3,500% more effective than other products thanks to its water solubility and rapid absorption. Revolutionary Relief has given people the freedom to live without pain, and almost ev everyone can benefit from using Revolutionary Relief because studies indicate that 52 million adults, maybe you, maybe someone you know, in the United States experience daily pain, whether the pain is age-related or caused by exertion at work, during exercise or due to recreational activities like golf or tennis or pickleball, Revolutionary Relief aims to provide relief. The creators of the product offer a 100% satisfaction guarantee showing their confidence in the effectiveness of the product. And for limited time, you can try Revolutionary Relief absolutely free for the first month, making it a risk-free opportunity to experience its potential benefits. To order Revolutionary Relief, you can visit their official website at revrelief.com slash free. Just go to revrelief.com slash free to order. You won't be disappointed. Okay. Apparently, there is a submersible company. Let's stop right there for a second. The difference between a submersible and a submarine, I confess I just learned this today as well while I was reading about this story. Apparently, a submarine has the power to, um, to steer itself. It can, it can take off from port itself. It can return to port itself. A submersible has to have a mothership which like drops it and then, and then retrieves it. So essentially the same experience when you're in it, it goes under the sea. But a submersible is what was supposedly on a tourist expedition in the Atlantic Ocean. It had five, six people aboard, or it has five or six people aboard. And this tourist company charges $250,000 for people to be taken under the sea, miles under the sea, to visit the remains of the Titanic. Now, you might be thinking, that's totally insane to do that. And if you're thinking that, I agree with you. Totally insane to do that. I feel compassion for these people if they're lost at sea. Apparently, the, apparently the control room um, back at port lost contact with this submersible only an hour and 45 minutes after it left. That doesn't seem to me like a good sign. Apparently, this company, what is the name of this company? Let me bring it up. Um, OceanGate. Apparently, OceanGate lost contact with another one of its submersibles last year, but it was only for a brief period of time because when the submersible reached the depth of the sea where the Titanic remains are, um, it's hard to have communication. The communication gets really sketchy between dry land and under the sea. So they lost contact with the submersible for a little while while it was uh, exploring the remains, but then they, they, they got contact with it again after a little bit. That's not what happened this time. This time, after an hour and 45 minutes, they lost contact and they ping back and forth every 15 minutes so that they can know whether there's a problem or not. And they lost, they lost contact. This is a really, I mean, it's a terrifying thing to think about. I mean, it, it has that creepy element to it, which I think is why so many people are talking about it. Because you think about the Titanic, the Titanic, one of the most famous tragedies in the entire modern world, and now the Titanic has arguably caused even more fatalities. The, the, the Titanic fatality count has potentially increased. I pray to God that it hasn't. I pray that they just lost some kind of communication, but I have to say it doesn't sound good if they haven't been able to contact the submersible in how many hours now? going on a day that doesn't that doesn't sound good at first the reports were saying that they that there was no confirmation of how many people were on board or if there were people on board but sky news reported that the family of british billionaire um hamish harding confirmed that he was on board this is what his son said he said my or his stepson he said, my stepdad, Hamish Harding, Hamish Harding, has gone missing on a submarine. Pray for a successful recovery. And then again, posted thoughts and prayers for my stepfather, Hamish Harding, as his submarine has gone missing, exploring Titanic. Search and rescue mission is underway. The U.S. Coast Guard is taking part in this. Ocean Gate Expeditions, the company that sponsored this, says that they're turning out all resources to try to search for this. This is, it's terrifying. It's terrifying. It's really sad. 
Um, it seems insane to me why someone would want to go to the depths of the sea. Maybe these are the same sort of people that want to go to Mars, that want to go in a spaceship. You couldn't pay me enough to do either, to go in a submarine or to go in a spaceship. But maybe I don't have the explorer uh, bone in my body that some of these people do, or maybe they're just more reckless than I am. Who I don't know. I pray everything turns out, but this is quite a massive story that seems like the entire internet is watching as this unfolds. We'll have to see what's um, what's to come of it. So I got, a, I got, when I say a handful of emails, that might be the understatement of the year. I got quite a few emails from you guys asking why I didn't talk about Juneteenth yesterday. And the reason for that is very simple. The reason that I didn't talk about Juneteenth yesterday is because I think that everybody is wrong about Juneteenth. On both sides of the aisle, I have not heard a single person with the correct take on Juneteenth. I think conservatives are being, how do I phrase this delicately? Well, I don't need to be delicate. Conservatives are completely missing the boat on this. Conservatives are saying that Juneteenth is a CRT holiday, that Juneteenth is a BLM holiday. There are some conservatives that said it shouldn't even be a, a workplace holiday. People should be at work on Juneteenth. There are some conservatives who even, um, I don't want to say propagating a conspiracy because that might be a little bit strong, but some conservatives are even proposing the idea that the reason that the left is all gung-ho about Juneteenth is because the left is trying to destroy July 4th by offering instead another summer holiday that they can celebrate as if it were Independence Day while getting rid of actual Independence Day because the left doesn't like America. That's kind of the position of the right right now. Uh, the left, of course, um, would like us to think on the surface level that Juneteenth is the celebration of when the last remaining slaves received word about the Emancipation Proclamation, realizing that they were free. And if that were the case, I actually think that that would be a wonderful thing to celebrate. I think that that should be added to our calendar. But it's not what the left actually wants. What the left actually wants, and they said this in a couple of tweets that I'm going to read to you, um, they said that they want to use this day as a way to highlight the systemic racism that exists today in our society. So that, of course, is why conservatives are saying that this is a CRT holiday, a critical race theory holiday, why they're saying it's a Black Lives Matter holiday, because that's what the left wants it to be. So the right is wrong about Juneteenth actually being a critical race theory holiday, and the left is wrong, trying to make it a critical race theory holiday. So the reason I didn't talk about this yesterday is because everyone is literally wrong about this. Every single person. So Elizabeth Warren tweeted, she said, Juneteenth is a celebration of the end of slavery and a reminder that all these years later, black Americans still feel the weight of racism and discrimination. This holiday calls on us to continue fighting for racial justice, and that's what I'm going to do. So Elizabeth Warren is trying to weaponize this holiday into pushing a Black Lives Matter political agenda. The Black Lives Matter movement was founded by Marxists who want to abolish the nuclear family, who, want, who are anti-capitalist, who want the fall of the United States. No thank you. No, no thank you. Ilhan Omar says this year, Juneteenth comes just days after a report detailing rampant racism and abuse in the Minneapolis Police Department. Today is both a celebration of the progress we have made and a reminder of the need for reparations for the historical trauma. So Ilhan Omar wants to use Juneteenth as a way to transform the United States into a socialist utopia. That's what reparations are. It's the government taking money from one person, forcibly giving it to another without the permission of the first in the name of some kind of quote unquote justice. So the left clearly wants to use Juneteenth in a way that I reject. The right, however, is missing the point that Juneteenth has been, by the way, a holiday in Texas for decades before the left made this effort in the last couple of years to make this a federal holiday or a federally recognized holiday. And in and of itself, putting politics aside for a second, Juneteenth is something that we should be very proud of. We know that slavery is an incredible stain on our nation, on that part of the history of our nation. But at this point in our nation, the more important thing to focus on is the fact that we overcame that tremendous sin, that we overcame that tremendous stain. We should be celebrating that we restored the promise of our constitution to every person to whom it was due. 
that is worth celebrating. And if that were what Juneteenth is, I'd be all on board with that. That's actually a, an amazing thing to celebrate. It's something I'm incredibly proud of as an American, something I'm going to teach my child and that other children should be taught as well. But conservatives, the reason conservatives are wrong about this is because they're allowing the left to define politically what this holiday is. They're allowing the left to make it a critical race theory holiday, to make it a Black Lives Matter holiday, to make it a racial justice holiday, when that's not actually what it is at all. So the reason that I didn't talk about Juneteenth is because sometimes conservatives really annoy me. Sometimes conservatives just really bug me with how they react because conservatives have a choice. We can sit around and complain about the left weaponizing something to push their own agenda, but that's what the left does. Don't we expect this by now? If we actually want to do something to counter what the left is doing with Juneteenth, then we would mandate at the state level that schools teach children how the United States used our own constitution, our own founding documents to overcome the lapse of slavery. The lapse of the people that were applying the laws in our nation that allowed slavery. If conservatives actually cared as much as they're outraged on Twitter, then they would prohibit critical race theory in school. And if the school system is teaching critical race theory, they'd pull their children out and they'd homeschool those children. But it seems to me that some conservatives are more interested in bellyaching online about this than doing something about it. So that's why I didn't talk about Juneteenth because everyone is wrong about this. We don't have to let the left define things. We can define things. It's just sometimes not the easiest thing to do. Sometimes it's easier to write an angry tweet about it. The other part of this that I would be remiss if I didn't debunk is this part of Ilhan Omar's tweet about racism and abuse in the Minneapolis Police Department. We're gonna talk about that in just a second, but first I wanna talk to you about American Heart for Gold. I don't mean to sound all doom and gloom, well, I kind of do because I feel like we're on the brink of a massive financial crisis. First, we had Silicon Valley Bank collapse. Then we had Signature Bank collapse. Then we had First Republic Bank collapse. And then we had Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen admit to us that the FDIC and the Fed are essentially going to pick and choose which banks to rescue and which banks not to rescue based basically on wokeness. So my question is, is our money really safe in this system? And I'll be honest and tell you, I don't feel confident that it is. That's why I highly recommend that you do what I did, call the only precious metals dealer that I trust, American Heart for Gold. They make it simple and easy to protect your savings and retirement accounts with physical gold and silver. With one short phone call, they can have physical gold and silver delivered right to your door or inside your IRA or 401k. If you call them right now, they will give you up to $1,500 of free silver on your first order. So don't wait. Call them right now. Call 866 866- 781-7499. That's 866-781-7499. Or text Liz, L-I-Z, to 65532. Again, the phone number is 866-781-7499. Or if you prefer text messaging, you can text Liz to 65532. Okay, so Ilhan Omar says, This year, Juneteenth comes just days after a report detailing rampant racism and abuse in the Minneapolis Police Department. And I thought this was interesting. So the Department of Justice, Biden's Department of Justice, the same Department of Justice that calls parents who want to challenge school board members who are embracing critical race theory as potential domestic terrorists, the same Department of Justice that labels those of us who might fly a don't tread on me flag in front of our houses as potential uh, militia violent extremists, the same Department of Justice that's gone after President Trump umpteen times just because they don't like his politics, the Department of Justice that we know and love and trust that aren't politically biased at all, just neutral arbiters of the truth, neutral arbiters of justice here, this Department of Justice that had no interest whatsoever in finding systemic racism, especially after the death of George Floyd in the same police department that was involved in the death of George Floyd. So no politics whatsoever. Let's remember that these are people to be trusted. The Department of Justice found systemic racism in the Minneapolis Police Department. And listen, they have some examples of um, things that happened. Minneapolis police officers that did things that, sure, beget more questions. 
I'm not gonna take the word of the Department of Justice when they give a tiny little snippet of an example. I don't believe the Department of Justice. I don't give them the benefit of the doubt. I need the full 110% context before I will make a judgment on anything the Department of Justice claims. And so for that reason, we're not gonna go word for word through this report because the Department of Justice has surrendered their reputation. But what I will say is the Center for the Study of Partisanship and Ideology, this is CSPI, uh, pointed up some really interesting facts that undermine Ilhan Omar's tweet. They said Minneapolis is 19% black. So 19% of residents in Minneapolis are black people, yet black people make up 89% of shooting suspects. We talk about a disparity, that's a significant disparity. 19% black residents, 89% of shooting suspects are black. The CSPI says this means that black people are 33 times more likely than white people to shoot someone, probably higher given unsolved cases. The Department of Justice, this is is again a tweet from CSPI or one one of their research fellows, says the Department of Justice says Minneapolis police are racist because they stop black people at six and a half times the rate of whites. That's one of the foundational premises of this uh, Department of Justice report. But black people in the city are over 30 times more likely to shoot someone. And then CSPI says they have indeed discovered systemic racism, but it's against white people. Now you you can take or leave that pithy comment if you want, but that is quite interesting to note that one of the pivotal claims in this report is that for traffic stops, more black people are stopped than white people, six and a half times more likely to be stopped if you're black than if you're white. And yet, the suspects in shootings, like a very serious crime, black people are 30 times more likely to be the suspects, suspect in shootings. 30 times more likely to shoot someone. Context is king. And the Department of Justice assumes that you will not look for more context. Now, there are gonna be people that say, well, traffic stops is not exactly hunting down a shooting suspect, but you know what often comes hand in hand? Crime. One crime often comes hand in hand with another crime. If you disregard a crime as serious as shooting someone, are you trying to tell me that you're just a perfect little citizen on the road too? Statistically, that is very unlikely. Statistically, that has been debunked. Also worth noting in the city of Minneapolis, if there is systemic racism in the police force, just entertaining the premise of the Department of Justice for one second, the mayor is a Democrat, the district attorney is a Democrat, the attorney general is a Democrat, the city council is majority Democrat, um, the Congress representatives and senators that represent that area are both Democrats, as are the state legislators and the state senators, as is the police chief. So I don't know what the Department of Justice is trying to say about the Democratic Party, but if they're trying to say that the Democratic Party is the one responsible for racism in this country, then you know maybe I will give the Department of Justice report on Minneapolis another read here, but something tells me that's not the point that they're, that they're trying to make here. Um, do you guys know what day it is today? Or more importantly, do you know what day it is tomorrow? Well, let me tell you what day it is tomorrow. Tomorrow is June 21st, 2023. Yes, it's a very special day. Hope you guys are all prepared for June 21st, 2023. You might be thinking, what are you talking about, Liz? What on earth am I missing? Did I forget something significant? And the answer to that is indeed you did. You forgot something so pivotal, so existential, that you might actually be destroyed without even realizing it, because tomorrow, my friends, is the day Greta Thunberg has been warning us about. On June 21st of 2018, Greta Thunberg posted the following tweet. She said, a top climate scientist is warning that climate change will wipe out all of humanity unless we stop using fossil fuels over the next five years. Let me repeat that. A top climate scientist is warning that climate change will wipe out all of humanity unless we stop using fossil fuels over the next five years. That was June 21st, 2018. 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023. 
We are T minus one day until all of humanity is wiped out because we didn't stop using fossil fuels, according to the top climate scientists. And of course, Greta Thunberg. I hope you guys are prepared. I hope you have your go bags or your rocket ships or whatever it is you're doing to try to save yourself from this catastrophe, that this impending catastrophe that we're facing tomorrow. Because you know, we're not allowed to question the science. We're not allowed to debate scientific ideas and hypotheses. We're not allowed to push back on the opinions of the experts when the experts are experts in the science. We're simply not allowed because we, you and I, we're the sorry people. We're just the silly little peons. We just have to say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, to everything that these scientists tell us, even when they are totally, entirely, ridiculously, cataclysmically wrong, like Greta Thunberg. All right, the United Nations, please tell me why the United Nations, why we in the United States continue to give money to this organization. Do you know how much of our money we give to the United Nations every year? Look at this, look at this tweet from the United Nations. Look at this tweet. We're gonna pull it up here on the screen for you. It says, hate speech incites violence and intolerance, undermines diversity and social cohesion, harms peace and development. This international day for countering hate speech, learn more about the impacts and actions you can take to say no to hate. You'll notice the picture that accompanies this tweet. The picture, it's a very clever graphic. It's a red background. And on top of the red background is a blue grenade. This grenade is made up of keyboard keys that have numbers and letters on them, obviously, depicting that your words are actually deadly violence. And on top of the grenade is the caption, words can be weapons. So the United Nations is not hiding what they think. This is not an inference that I'm making. This is not an assumption that, uh, is an assumption or a conclusion that I'm jumping to. This is what the United Nations thinks. They They think our words can be weapons as deadly as a grenade. If you throw a grenade at someone, they die if they're hit by a grenade. If you throw words at someone, does that kill someone? Well, the obvious answer to that is no. But what the United Nations is trying to do, they're trying to associate or conflate words that they don't like, that perhaps dissent from their political agenda with actual violence that kills people. Why are they doing this? Because if they can label words as actual violence, then they are justified in taking action to censor and to silence those words, your words and my words. This is their their agenda, their global agenda. If you click on the link in that tweet, which I did, if you click on the link in this tweet, it takes you to a page. Let me click on it here so I can read it exactly to you. It's the United Nations page on hate speech, and it talks about how, uh, it talks about its agenda to stop hate speech. It says the UN strategy and plan of action on hate speech, it talks about its strategy to, um, let me read this sentence. The strategy emphasizes the need to counter hate holistically while respecting freedom of opinion and expression and to collaborate with relevant stakeholders, including civil society organizations, media outlets, tech companies, and social media platforms. So the United Nations wants big tech to censor you, wants to control what the media narrative is on words and on hate speech. And remember, the phrase hate speech is a made up phrase. Hate speech is what? Something that offends someone else? Well, yes, that's that's free speech. That's why we have a protection for free speech in our constitution. If all speech were just pretty and fine, roses and rainbows, we wouldn't have to protect it because no one would try to stifle it. But people have a right to say things that can be awful, can, can be rude, can be wrong, can be immoral, can be mean. And it's those words that we protect because people still have a right to say them. But the United Nations wants to obliterate your right to say that, and it's funded by us. Like, we expect this. This, this phrase, stakeholders, that's a phrase from the World Economic Forum. That's a phrase from Klaus Schwab. He wrote a book called Stakeholder Capitalism. It's about how he wants to implement his Great Reset policy. Stakeholder capitalism 
is um, a euphemism for essentially a Chinese Communist Party style social credit score system. It's his ESG system, right? Stakeholders, stakeholder capitalism means businesses no longer just pay attention to the interests of their shareholders and of their consumers to build a profitable business, but they take into account sustainability and DEI and whatever else the left tells them to at any given time in pursuit of their ESG score. And it's really not capitalism anymore, because even though it's ostensibly a market economy, the businesses aren't really free to do what they want. They have to adhere to an ideology or they get squeezed out of the market. So when you hear this word, stakeholder, stakeholders, this is what the United Nations is referencing. They're referencing Klaus Schwab's Great Reset Agenda, which is anti-American. And again, we expect this from these globalist entities, whether it's the United Nations, whether it's the World Economic Forum, but the United Nations is funded by us. It's funded by the United States of America. Your money and my money goes to the United Nations. Why on earth are we allowing our money to fund that? To fund an effort to label our speech as weapons, grenades, as justification to silence us? This needs to be added to the list of questions for all the Republicans in the Republican primary is, will you defund the United Nations? And they need to have an adequate answer, a thorough and adequate answer on how they would deal with the United Nations because I am done with my money being used to fund political efforts to silence me, and you should be too. You should be too. Here's the thing. The reason the Democrats want us silenced was probably perfectly exemplified by Democratic Congresswoman Stacey Plaskett. Probably you've never heard of her. She's not a very high profile Congresswoman. She's from the state of New York, but she was talking about Donald Trump. She hates Donald Trump, hates Donald Trump. This is exactly who would be defining what is hate speech if Democrats and leftists were in charge of the definition of hate speech, which they are because they created the term. This is what, this is, this is a Freudian slip from the Congresswoman about what she thinks should happen to Donald Trump. Take a listen to this. Having Trump not only have had the codes, but now having the classified information for Americans and being able to put that out and share it in his resort with anyone and everyone who comes through should be terrifying to all Americans. Mm -hmm. And he needs to be shot, stopped. Oh, he needs to be shot, huh? Shot or stopped? I don't know about you, but when I'm trying to say stopped, I never literally never accidentally say shot. Never. I say stopped if I mean stopped. That is what you call a Freudian slip. That is what the left thinks of you and me. Those are the same types of leftists that are trying to, that are trying to label what you and I think or when you and I contradict their agenda as hate speech to try to silence us. We have to put a stop to this. We have to defund organizations like the United Nations. Guys, I mentioned this on the show last night, but I want to repeat it for anybody who didn't hear. If you use promo code PRIDE at lizwheeler.com slash locals, you can get a month of ad-free episodes. I know a lot of advertisers are hijacking the ad spots and pushing a pride agenda with their otherwise innocuous products like Downy or like uh, Febreze. But if you go to lizwheeler.com slash locals and use promo code pride, you can get a month of ad-free episodes so you don't have to deal with that nonsense at all. At all. Thank you for watching today. Thank you for listening. I'm Liz Wheeler. This is The Liz Wheeler Show. Ready, give this video a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button below, and ring the bell to make sure you never miss a video.